Thank you to Seattle Town Hall. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here tonight. Uh, it's always splendid to re return to this city uh, and to the Town Hall, primarily because I did spend about a year here in 2012. And when I hear these debates, for instance, uh, on the head tax, when I hear that uh, there is this uh, boisterous uh, dialogue uh, regarding how to treat um, corporations like Amazon who want to move into this city. Uh, the first thought that occurs to me is that it's all not about the economy, really. It's about a kind of social ecology. Because think about it. Why do corporations want to come to this splendid city? It's because of the community that you have created. Because they want to move into a community which is fun, which has a good music scene, that has bonds of solidarity, where people are not walking on the street looking as if you know, they are desperate, lost souls. This is what they seek in Seattle. The quality of the human condition that your community has created. That is an eco ecology that has, no one has designed. It sprang out of the history of this place. You, you can study the reasons why you have it, but it was a, a remarkable miracle of history and social evolution. Now, when a company like Amazon wants, however, to move here to enjoy this community, like humanity has done so many times before, we operate like stupid viruses, invading an organism which we're killing. The organism, the very organism that we want to inhabit, we're killing it. This is what we're doing to the planet. Right? This is the effect of us and our thoughtless, profit-maximizing, individualistic activity on our planet. This is what corporations do. They move into a new territory, like Europeans did in Africa, in Asia, here, in Australia, in New Zealand, colonize it, and then suddenly we realize that we have destroyed the very environment which, had, which drew us to this place. And the only defense to this is collective action. It is democracy. It is for the people of this community to stand up and to say, look, to the Amazons of the world, you know what? You're not very good at being even selfish. Because the way you are going about, you're going to destroy the, the very thing that you're coming to Seattle for. And we need to preserve this community. And you need to pay tax, I know. You don't want to pay taxes. But, you know, as Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, I like paying taxes because they buy me civilization. The problem with corporate logic is that it does not understand civilization. Corporatism and civilization are two alien forces. And the only thing that can bring some kind of detente between corporate logic and economic and environmental and communitarian sustainability is the democratic process, making them pay, for instance. I'm not saying that the head tax is the best way of doing it. It would be much preferable if we could actually tax their profits directly. But given that they always hide their, their profits in some tax haven somewhere, you have to start somewhere. Uh, we can quibble about whether you should tax property, make them pay higher rents, whether they should pay head tax, and so on and so forth. Anyway, you can see that I have been immersed in this debate because um, my mind just took me to an NPR today to be interviewed about the book that brings me to town. So I ended up talking about the head tax. That reminded me that it really doesn't matter what you talk about. Whatever you talk about, you go back to the same issue, which is the fragility of communities, the fragility of democracy. Democracy is the most fragile of flowers, and it is constantly being trampled upon. Now, what we also forget is that democracy is something that is absolutely deeply despised by the powerful. The powerful never liked democracy as an idea. Indeed, speaking as an Athenian for a moment, all the great Athenians that you know of yesteryear, like Plato, Aristotle, they loathed democracy. Plato wrote the Republic as a treatise against democracy. He was actually foaming at the mouth, at the word, at, the, at hearing the word democracy. He was calling it oklocracy, which means in Greek something like mob rule, 
But you know, you hear the word mob rule being used by the powerful when they don't like the results of democratic decision making. Uh, Aristotle. Aristotle actually was a very interesting fellow because he gave us a, a splendid definition of democracy while being an anti-democrat himself. Uh, and the definition he gave was, it's a, he said, it, it is a system of government where the many who are by definition the poor control government. If you reconceptualize democracy like this, you realize that we really never had democracy in the West, ever. The many and the poor never controlled government. Indeed, the whole point of the American Constitution, the very point of the German Constitution, of the British Constitution, they, well, they, there's no such thing because they are not writing it down, which, which makes it even more sinister. The French Constitution, the Greek Constitution, the whole point of our so-called so liberal democratic constitutions was how to keep the demos out of democracy. How to ensure that the people would never be in power, that they would be consulted, that they would, made to be, they would, they would made, be made to feel that they somehow control government without controlling it. If you read the Federalist Papers, it's explicit. It's all about checks and balances, where checks and balances are not meant in order to keep you know, the executive um, from... Um, trampling our rights or the rights of the judiciary to be independent. No. It was all about how to make sure that the property rights of the 1% are maintained against a mob that um, um, is, 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 might get the crazy idea in its head uh, about the redistribution of property rights over wealth and assets. Uh, indeed, when people talk to me about China these days, they say, oh, it's so anti-democratic. Yeah, well, what was the West? Remember, capitalism grew up in the 19th century in this country, but also in Europe, with the exception of England and parts of Scotland, where it had already started emerging at the end of the 18th century. Let me remind you that in the 19th century, liberalism was defined as the ideology that would be powerfully competing against the idea of democracy. Even somebody as liberal and a wonderful person, a fantastic philosopher, very good writer, um, defender of women's rights, John Stuart Mill, the archetypal liberal, was an anti-democrat. He believed that democracy was an awful system of government. And he did not encourage um, one person, one vote, ever. He was actually fighting against it. So liberalism was juxtaposed against democracy. And it was only the great financial crisis that began in the 1840s and then were turbocharged in the 1880s. And then immediately after that, the turn of the century, the next financial crisis, which in the first decade of the 20th century gave you the Federal Reserve. And then after that, 1929, it was only these processes activated by financial collapses that created, effectively, a good press for the word democracy. And suddenly, we started having these, this, this, what used to be a contradiction in terms. We talk about liberal democracy. Liberalism was against democracy. The two were like saying, you know, socialist capitalism. Liberal democracy to somebody, to an intellectual of the 19th century, would have sounded like it, the, the term socialist capitalism today. You know, what on earth are these people talking about? That's what, they would have, that's what John Stuart Mill would have thought about. Effectively, what I'm saying is that democracy has many enemies. If we ever get a chance of a democratic um, decision-making process, at either at the level of the town hall, or the level of our state, the level of our federal government, we must count ourselves lucky, because there are so very few points in the history, in our collective history, when we actually had something resembling democracy. And you can see the incredible war against any vestiges of democracy anywhere where they are. Uh, 
two years ago I mentioned this, if some of you remember it, I'm very pleased, but most of you wouldn't. I mentioned that when I was in government in 2015, I was struck by two things that I heard being said by rather powerful men, and of course they were men, they were not women. Uh, not that they said something that I didn't know, but it's one thing, you know, for us who theorize and think big thoughts on our own, either in a splendid church like this or in our own community. It's quite an, one thing to imagine that this is what powerful men say to one another. It's quite another to actually hear it with your own ears. Quite educational. And the two men that I'm referring to, one is, was Barack Obama, and the other was Wolfgang Schäuble, the German finance minister. I remember when I met Barack Obama in the White House, he was actually extremely nice and very encouraging on a personal basis. First thing he said, and took me aback with that, he said, look, you're right in your analysis. We had never discussed before. I was right in my analysis about the Greek debt and how it had to be cut and restructured and that austerity in my country had gone far too far and had to end. He said, you look, you're completely right. But you've got to compromise because, you know, there are very few degrees of freedom in this world. And before I said, word, well, I did actually say, I said, Mr. President, I wake up in the morning and go to bed at night dreaming of compromise, but I'm not going to be compromised. There's a fundamental difference between the two. And he smiled and, you know, you know he, said, and he said, look, when I was elected, after, I, um, after my inauguration, I was completely helpless. I had to bail out Wall Street. He actually used a term that was very unpresidential. He said, those bastards in Wall Street. Uh, I had to, you know, and it was like drinking a glass of political poison. That was the word that he used, the word, the phrase he used. So he was present, pre presenting himself, think about it, the most powerful man in the world, talking to the most bankrupt minister of finance of the most devastated and insolvent bankrupt state in the world. And he's presenting himself to me as powerless. Effectively saying that the democratic mandate he had just received in 2008 meant nothing because he had to do what he had to do, which is to, you know, employ and deploy massive socialism for the bankers while throwing the majority of the people of this country into the, you know, the arena, the Roman arena of unfettered market forces. That's what he was saying. He didn't say it in those terms, but that's what he meant. And he was inviting me to, to, to be compromised as well. That, that was my interpretation. But he was extremely nice about it. That's the difference between the current president and the previous president. It's just a question of... It's anthropological, the difference. Uh, but I doubt that there is much difference when it comes to actual policies on the ground. There are some, but much less than you think they are. The other man was Wolfgang Schäuble, the, the German finance minister, who actually was an education for me. Because I used to think that these... Very, you know, okay, the finance minister of the richest European country a country that has a quadrillion surplus with uh, the United States of America, with China, with the rest of Europe, with the rest of the world. Okay? And by the end of our relationship, I saw this man go to pieces. Why? Because I, he could see we had these fierce con conversations and confrontations, but nevertheless, I realized that he knew that what he was doing in the end was wrong, by his people, by my people, and by the people of Europe. And when I said to him, I pushed him, and to his credit, he admitted it. And I said to him, so what are we going to do, Wolfgang? We have been elected, we have a mandate, a democratic mandate, to do things differently from this. Do you know what he did? He shrugged his shoulders, and he, not happily, not condescendingly, but very, very unhappily. I would call him depressed at that moment. So, you know, I wrote this book about my daughter, or speaking to my daughter about the economy. Uh, and people say to me, why did you do that? Well, 
my daughter really doesn't like me lecturing her because she thinks that I was brought to this world to embarrass, humiliate, and bore her. <laughs> She's a teenager. That's what teenagers think about parents, don't they? Um, so it's, I was not responding to some demand, to some appetite that she had for, for a book like this. I was simply trying to organize my own thoughts, because if you cannot understand, explain the economy to a teenager uh, in a language that everybody understands, then you're not understanding it yourself. So I used that. I exploited my daughter. I mean, she didn't do anything. It was just in my head. I was trying to imagine that I am explaining things to her and she going, oh, not again. <laughs> so I tried to make it as palatable and understandable and exciting for her. Whether I succeeded or not is another matter. But people ask me, you know, why, so why did, after writing a book like Adults in the Room, after writing a book like, you know, about global capitalism, the crisis of 2008, the global minotaur, that I, as, as you heard, I, I was very pleased to be presenting it back in 2014, I believe, in the town hall here in Seattle. Um, look, the reason why I wrote this book is very simple. We have a moral and political duty to empower ourselves and our children to speak authoritatively about the economy. And the reason for that is that in the world we live, the economy penetrates every dimension of life, whether it's the head tax in Seattle, the schooling system, the health service, what's happening in Syria today, the relationship between the United States, Europe, and China, climate change, everything goes through this, if you want, um, panopticon of what's called the economy. It would be a tragedy for democracy. Plato will have won his greatest victory, crushing the fragile flower of democracy, if we all, and my daughter, are convinced by the establishment, by the powers that be, by the economics profession, by finance ministers and so on, by the International Monetary Fund, by the Federal Reserve, that we better leave the matters of the economy to the experts, to the economists. See, I have no problem with experts. I'm not a climate change denier. I love science. I believe that if we need to build a bridge, we need experts to build it. It would be stupid to build it democratically. <laughs> if we all have a view as to how, we, you know, what to do to build a bridge, the bridge will collapse, and we are going to be responsible for many, many deaths. But the economy is not like civil engineering projects. The economy is society. It's you and me. It is everything. And the f what I, I always told my students when I was a, a professor, uh, is, look, it's easy to mistake e economics, the study of the economy, for a science. Except it isn't. It looks very much like a science. Because if you, if you open a textbook of economics, it's, you, you don't understand it because it's mathematical, it has a jargon that is as impenetrable as any good book on thermodynamics to somebody who does no physics. There are computers involved. There are data sets. There is testing of theories. Huh? There are obs empirical observation goes into the computer. The computer is full of a mathematical model that some mathematical economist has created, very much like the process which yields every day weather forecasts. How are weather forecasts produced? You have a mathematical model of the weather system, it's inside the computer. The computer is connected to various implements that measure wind temperature, wind direction, water temperature, air pressure, satellite data, and so on. The, all this empirical data is fed into the computer. The mathematical model is there. Boom, comes the forecast. And these are getting better. Today, we have almost decent weather forecasts compared to 20, 30 years ago. That's a science. Now, why can't we say the same thing about finance, the economy? We have mathematical models, we have uh, the, you know, the computers 
with those mathematical equations in it, uh, you, you have huge quantities of data now, microeconomic data, data on what every consumer does, especially now that we have Facebook and Google and so on, and Amazon. You have data on uh, interest rates from all over the world, exchange rates, share prices, bond prices, derivative prices. Oh, it's even more society, capitalism, produces even more data than nature does. It goes in there, and out comes the forecast. I'll tell you what the difference is. Profound difference between the two. In the case of meteorology and physics, nature doesn't give a damn about our theories regarding nature. It doesn't give a damn. So whatever our forecast will be about the weather tomorrow in Seattle, the weather in Seattle will be whatever it would have been independently of our forecasts about the weather in Seattle. Yes? Which is fantastic for a physicist and a meteorologist, because it means that the weather is an objective judge, an objective arbiter of our theories about the weather. If I, the theory is stupid and the prediction is dumb, the weather will tell you so. And, you know, eventually, through a process of Darwinian selection, the bad meteorologists will be weeded out and the good ones will survive and their models and mathematics will prevail. But imagine for a second, just for a second, that I am renowned, I said imagine, okay? We economists can assume anything, so for a moment be economy. Imagine that I am a renowned financial expert who has predicted every stock exchange crash in the last 30 years. A little small aside, I'm opening a parenthesis here. No financial crash has ever been predicted by anyone except by chance. Yeah? Remember 2008? Who predicted it? No one. I had written something about the crash coming and of course, I had no idea what I was saying. People would say, yeah, but you would say that, you're a lefty, you always predict the, clash, the crash of, of, of capitalism. You know, a stopped clock is correct twice a day. Close parenthesis. <laughs> but for a moment, imagine that I am this guru of the financial markets that has predicted everything. Whenever there was a, a downswing, I predicted it. And let's imagine that after this event tonight, we go out, some of us, and I have a couple of beers, or six, and I go back to my hotel, downtown Seattle, and out, as a prank, I tweet that tomorrow Nasdaq or the Wall Street stock exchange is going to collapse. Do you know what's going to happen? It will collapse. Because people believe me. Yeah? Even if I did it as a joke, it will happen. I can give you examples where you can have a fantastic theory which does not, its prediction does not materialize only because it became known. So that's the opposite. A good theory which is violated by the facts because it was good. And a bad theory, a drunken theory, which was confirmed just because it was made public. See, you see the difference? Nature doesn't give a damn about our predictions, but society is our predictions. Because society is what you and I do. And what you and I do depends on what you and I believe. So if we believe something, and suddenly we change what our belief, that belief, the change in belief, feeds into a different social and economic outcome. So the phenomenon that we are studying as economists huh, is intertwined, inextricably linked, to our own theories about it. So economics is part of the phenomenon it tries to explain. So we like, you know, a cat chasing its own tail. That's why it can never be a science. Ever. Anybody who tells you economics is a science is either a fool or is trying to fool you. There is no third option. And proof of that is, of course, economists have never predicted any significant economic event in the history of capitalism. And never will. Therefore, if there are no experts and economics is not a science, what do we do? Well, what we need to do, we need each one of us to, becomes, to become able to tackle economic questions with a degree of authority. That means we have a, a political and moral duty to become acquainted 
with the ways of capitalism, this is the system, the economic system we live in, so as to prevent the economists from fooling us about how capitalism works. Communists are not bad people, they're, they're not fooling us on purpose. Uh, they need to fool themselves in order to do what they're doing. Because, you know, it's a very boring life. And the only way of maintaining this um, process of pseudoscience is by convincing yourself that what you're doing is science. So treat them with humility, with empathy, with sympathy, you know, like lost children who are in a, in a church. Treat them in a Christian way. Eh? They need your support. But what you don't need is them to convince you that they know what is the answer to the head tax, to Donald Trump's tax cuts, corporate tax cuts, to the questions about climate change. You are as much of an expert as anyone else. And this is the beauty of democracy. Because democracy is... You know, Oscar Wilde was absolutely spot on when he said that socialism will never happen because it takes too long, too many long evenings. The same applies to democracy. It's, it's a pain in the neck. I, you know, I got involved in the political processes back in 2015, and I can tell you that I find them extremely boring. The whole, the whole democratic process is a pain. Sitting in Parliament, I suppose the same thing happens here in Congress, is, it, is mind-bogglingly dull. It's got nothing to do with politics, by the way. It's all a bureaucratic process. But, as Winston Churchill said, it is the best of all alternatives. But, and here's how I'm going to leave you. This is also what I tried to explain to my daughter in the book. Oh, by the way, after a year and a half of begging her to read it, she read it. And I asked her, what did, what did you think, darling? She said, well, by your standards, not bad. <laughs> so, that, that's, you know, the most important book review I've had. <laughs> um, close the, the bracket again. Um, Look, what we must understand is the evolution, the history of, that has led to the societies in which we find ourselves. Allow me to try to put it in three minutes and then open it up to Q&A, because that's the most interesting part of tonight. Look, once upon a time, power was one sphere, one realm. The lord of the land the baron, the king, hmm? in medieval Europe, let's say, had all the power. It was military, hmm? and because he could conjure up military power, he had political power, and, of, and that meant he was rich, <laughs> which means he also had economic power. Capitalism ruptured this unitary realm of power, split it into two different realms, the political and the economic. Before that, the word economic didn't mean anything. It's no great wonder that you know, Harvard University, when it was set up, Cambridge University in Britain, you know, all the great universities in the world, didn't even consider having an economics department back then. The word economics did not exist. The word economy didn't mean anything. When the ancient Greeks talked about e economics, the Greek word, ecos means home. It means home economics. It means how to manage your household. It's got nothing to do with what we re refer to as economics. But what happened was the eviction of the peasants in England and Scotland, which was necessary to replace them with sheep because their wool, the sheep's wool, was valuable in the new international trade routes that had been established due to advances in navigation and shipping. Suddenly, those 70% you know, of the peasants were evicted within 40 years in Britain. Can you imagine that? They had nowhere to go. Suddenly, all this labor is extracted from the land, and they have to knock on doors in nearby villages and say, I will do anything for a loaf of bread. That's the first labor market. It's the first time in human history when people are actually selling their labor, selling it. It becomes commodified. And Immediately, land became a commodity, because suddenly we knew how much it was worth, every acre, because we knew how much wool it could grow. And the, international, the price of wool was determined internationally. So you throw into this mix Charles Watt's fantastic invention, the steam engine, you have, you have the first factory. 
But suddenly you have a new social class, which is neither peasants nor landlords, that have something called financial power or economic power. So for the first time in human history, the world of political power, the realm of political power and the realm of economic power are split. The merchants and the factory owners suddenly have, begin to have power, money, that the king didn't have anymore. More recently, we had another split. The economic sphere was dissected, divided and multiplied again between industrial power and financial power. So the banker acquired power and not at the Edison, the Henry Ford of the world. So this is what is, has been happening. And you, as we are now in a world where the financial realm controls our lives, industrial power is second, and the political sphere has lost all power, democracy is confined to the least powerful sphere, to the political sphere, and this is why this fragile flower is being crushed. If you start thinking in those terms, and then start applying very basic ideas about, you know, how debt fuels profits. So, debt is to capitalism that which hell is to Christianity. Unpleasant, but absolutely essential for capitalism. And how the control of financial power by the bankers makes them effectively masters of the universe, because if their bets succeed, they become stinking rich. If they fail, you bail them out. Yeah? So if you start thinking in those terms, it's not difficult very quickly to acquire an economic expertise, which, if you do acquire it, then democracy has a chance. Thank you very much. Great. So Thank I believe you. we're going to take... Oh, sorry. Oh, no. No, I'm no, sorry. no, no, you go ahead. No, no. Um, so we now have about 20 minutes for questions. Just a quick reminder, please do use this microphone where I'm standing and line up here um, and keep your questions short in the form of a question so we can get through as many folks as possible. Um, and then do not forget that books will be for sale and there will be um, book signing in the lobby afterwards. Thank you all. Hi. Uh, I'm going to come down. I mean, this, is, this ex cathedra thing is ridiculous. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I've been wanting to see you talk for a long time, so this is excellent. Uh, my question is, in evaluating how to use our resources effectively and how to empower people economically, what is the use of economists or of... Of economics. Yes of economic analysis. So using the head tax example, maybe the head tax is a bad idea, that they're maybe taxing incomes is a better idea, or trying to tax revenue in some way is a better idea. So using economics to evaluate alternative options and decide on the best one. Uh, wh where is the role of economics in this world of empowering people, the role of economists in empowering uh, people with economic knowledge? Well, I think that, you know, why don't we just try something that is not often being tried? Common sense. <laughs> yeah? Anybody that tries to bamboozle you with very complicated theories and models and concepts should immediately be dismissed. But some basic ideas that, you know, we have an economic surplus, which is absolutely essential for civilization. So we need to produce a little bit more than what we consume to replace that which we have expended. So if you have a farm, uh, in order to, 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 to have development, you need at the end of the season to end up with a little bit more corn than what you started with so that you can plant again for the next season and so on. So you, you have an economic surplus. And the greater the economic surplus is, the more you can do with it. You can, the more you can invest in education, the more you can invest in the things that society wants. So, surplus is an important concept to have. Okay? So, then it, let's have a discussion about what that surplus should be. Because we, 
know very well that we have done a, a magnificent job at destroying this environment of ours. So I don't think we need more SUVs to be part of that surplus. Uh, yes, we, and we need a lot more um, effective uh, prevention of diseases. We need um, uh, more care for elderly people, but that needs more surplus so that the carers, the maintainers of our society, can be maintained themselves. Uh, we need um, more green energy so that we do not produce CO2 and so on and so on. So, okay, we proceed from there. Then, the question of debt. How much debt do we need in order to generate the surplus which is necessary for socially useful purposes? And what kind of debt? Do we need those financial instruments of Wall Street? And also, I, I have a, I'm a great believer in... Um, allow me just a, a tiny mathematical concept here. Identities as opposed to equations. Equations are theories. In physics, they're great. In economics, they don't work. Because all economic theories, I love economic theory, I'm an economic theorist. Uh, but I like economic theory in the same way I like chess. Chess is a fantastic game to play. It sharpens the mind. If you try to apply it in daily, li daily life, or on the battlefield, you are a complete and utter disaster. Imagine treating other people as if they are pawns. Or going you know, to, to war and, and planning your campaign as if it's a chessboard. Uh, the, and the rules are given by some God-given entity. So, equations theory... Identities, however, are important. So, for instance, let me give you an example. Hmm? Austerity. Why is austerity such a dangerous idea? Why does it never, ever work? It has never worked in the history of humanity. It will never work in the history of humanity. Never. Huh? It's a big statement, that. And I would like somebody to disprove it. You see, what the supporters of austerity try to do is they try to confuse us by identifying parsimony, frugality, with austerity. No comparison, no connection. And let me explain this in terms of an identity so that you understand why I'm saying ident identities are important and equations are, should be left outside. Look, if you and I cannot make ends meet, because our income is too low and our expenditure is too high. Now, we have to tighten our belt. I do believe in belt tightening at a personal level. If you don't tighten your belt and you continue to spend more than you earn, you're going to be in serious trouble. It is stupid to do it. Yeah? But take 2008, or even today, but let's go to 2008, because 2008 is a very good example of a great recession. Yeah? So what happens is, the private sector goes into a spasm. They stop investing. They fire people. So, in other words, to put it bl uh, bluntly, the private sector shrinks its expenditure. As it shrinks its expenditure, incomes shrink. The tax take of the federal government comes down. If the finance minister, the, your treasury secretary, panics and says, oh my goodness, I should apply belt tightening at the level of the economy because my, my inco income, the income of the state, is coming down. That is a catastrophe. Why? Because the state does not operate like a family. The great difference... Remember before I said that nature doesn't give a damn about our theories, because it's independent of our theories. Similarly, you and I can make ends meet by, reduce, by belt tightening for the simple reason that our income is independent of our expenditure. If you and I tonight decide to save some money and not go to a restaurant and stay at home and, you know, cook some pasta at home instead of going to a restaurant, we will save some money. Our income is not going to decline. Our income is independent of whether we go to the restaurant or not. But the Treasury Secretary, if in the middle of a recession when a private expenditure is coming down, if he or she, it's usually he, um, shrinks public expenditure, that's austerity in other words, you know, cuts pensions, cuts uh, social programs and so on and so forth, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is this. Public expenditure is going to come down at the time when private expenditure is coming down. The sum of private and public expenditure is going to come down. What is this necessarily equal to? That's the identity, always equal to. This is not a theory, it's a fact. 
It's like saying that 2 equals 2. It's not rocket science. The total expenditure, private and public, is national income. So what will happen is national income will sink faster. As national income uh, sinks faster as a result of austerity, of cutting social programs and social expenditure, what happens is the tax take goes down. So because the tax take got, went down initially, the Treasury reduced expenditure, thinking that now we're going to, you know, to balance the books. But no, because this reduction in, in expenditure pushes ta the tax take even further. And then if you react to this by pushing expenditure further down, you become Greece. <laughs> no, seriously. This is what happened in Greece. Now we, we, have, uh, we are in a state of a Great Depression in Greece. We've reduced wages by 40%. Pensions by 48%. And you know what happened? Our national income went down by 28%, which is what happened in this country between 1929 and 1933. So we have a Great Depression. John Steinberg come back to write in Greek the grapes of wrath. We have a Nazi party in parliament. So this is, yeah. if we understood our identities and forget about the theories and forget about the experts who always adopt theories that suit the bankers and the powers that be, we would be all better off. This was a very long answer, I'm sorry. Next. <laughs> yep. Yanis, uh, you ended uh, your first edition of the Global Minotaur with a, a speculation, not a prediction, but a speculation that the Global Minotaur was dead. And that, uh, mortally wounded. Mortally wounded, yeah, mortally wounded. And that, uh, what would replace it? What would, what would come after as a, the surplus recycling mechanism? Uh, Somebody had, who's read the book. You, uh, even to the last paragraph. <laughs> and you have uh, uh, two possibilities. One was the BRICS forming a, a, a coalition against the bankruptocracies, uh, or a return to Keynes's position at Bretton Woods. Uh, is, the, is the Minotaur dead? And, uh, and are, they, are either, I, I don't think it is because uh, the, we still have a treasury secretary from Goldman Sachs, uh, but... Uh, That's uh, standard. Yeah. All governments change, Goldman Democrat, Sachs Democrat remains. Democrat, Republican, we have treasury secretary <laughs> from Goldman Sachs. So what, what will replace it? Uh, well... Not a, not a prediction. Uh, we're, we live in a, a world of uncertainty. I will give you a quick answer because you don't know what he's talking about. Because he's read the book and you haven't. Uh, and you don't have to. Uh, allow me to say what happened in the end. Uh, yes, I do believe that the global minotaur remains mortally wounded and, or probably gone. He's a goner. And I'll explain in a minute what I mean by what this metaphor is. And, and the result is Donald Trump. Uh, everywhere. Not just in the United States. We have, we have you know, do you realize Trump is an international movement? You know, I met somebody from Austria today. We have an ultra-right-wing government in, in, in Austria. Your, 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 I mean, you were a child when you came here, but uh, the Austrian uh, minister for the police and the intelligence services is a neo-Nazi. In Austria, in the, in the land of, 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 of you know, the, the most enlightened people on earth, of Kreisky, we have a Nazi in charge of the intelligence services and of the police. Uh, so we have Trump everywhere now, or almost everywhere, and things are not looking very good. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll just very briefly, the global minotaur was a metaphor I used um, in a book that I wrote in 2010, sometime, some time ago, um, for the, what followed Bretton Woods. Remember Bretton Woods? Bretton Woods is a system that the new dealers in this country uh, Created, it was effectively the internationalization of the New Deal. FDR, the FDR administration, took the New Deal institutions and extended them, turned them into an umbrella. And under that umbrella, we had Europe, and it was in that context that the European Union became possible, and Japan. Uh, and the Bretton Woods system was an interesting system. You had, a, you had effectively a common currency, the dollar was the common currency, but with capital controls with huge restrictions on what the bankers could do. Goldman Sachs was very unhappy, thankfully. Um, and the American surpluses, because America was the only surplus country when, after the war, it was the only creditor. 
Sorry about this. It was the only creditor nation. It was the only country that exported more than in, that it imported. Hang on a second, what am I doing this? Just a second. Yes, it works. Right. Um, so, a significant chunk of American profits were, was being exported to Europe and to Japan to allow the Europeans and the Japanese to buy American. It was not philanthropy, it was just smart hegemony. Uh, but then after the 1970s, when that system collapsed, because Amer this country stopped having a surplus, it became a deficit country, um, what we had was a situation where the net exports of the rest of the world were coming to this country, your trade deficit made sure of that, it was operating as a vacuum cleaner that was sucking into, in the United States the exports of Germany, of France, of Holland, of Japan, and of course, later on, China. But how were, were you paying, not you, but this economy, how was it paying for the ever-expanding tra trade deficit? Through a tsunami of money that was coming, the, the profits of the German industrialists, the Japanese, the Chinese, and so was coming into Wall Street, seeking higher returns, closing the loop. Yeah? That's what I call the global minotaur. Don't ask me why. I've used an ancient Greek mythological uh, narrative in order to make it more palatable to my daughter. Not to my daughter, but you know, to recalcitrant readers like my daughter. Um, and what I said at the end of the book was 2008 killed that system. Even though the American trade deficit recovered, it was no longer able to stabilize global capitalism. And I was saying at the end of the book, and this is what you mentioned, that either we're going to have a new Bretton Woods, a new Bretton Woods that recalibrates and rebalances global capitalism through cooperation between Europe, China and the United States, uh, we're going to be in trouble, and I'm afraid that we're in trouble. And what you now see, the trade wars, the um, support that parochialism is receiving all over Europe, in this country with Trump and so on, is, if you want, a, just nothing more than a symptom of these unsustainable growing imbalances, a global capitalism that has lost its, its pace and its poise. And if we continue this, if this continues, uh, I very much fear that my daughter's generation isn't going to be in dire straits. Uh, in a recent interview, you mentioned the idea that uh, deflation leads to fascism, and this seems to go against the popular notion that, say, in the in the Weimar Republic in Germany, uh, hyperinflation led to the fascism there. Uh, so can you explain the connection between deflation and fascism? I will. Thank you. I'll repeat that question in my words. Uh, your words were fine, but, you know, I'm, I'm an old professor, so I have to do this. Um, what he's saying is that in a recent interview I said that deflation, periods of declining consumer prices, breed political monsters. Fascism, xenophobia, racism, and so on. Uh, and you correctly mentioned that there is a misunderstanding about the rise of Nazism in the 1930s in Germany. And the misunderstanding is that everybody focuses on what happened in the early parts of the 1920s in Germany, where there was rabid hyperinflation, caused primarily by the stupidity of the winners of the First World War that imposed huge reparations on the German nation, uh, punitive reparations, which forced the German Central Bank to print money in order to repay the debt, but in the end it created, created accelerating uh, exponentially accelerating prices until the, 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 the savings of the middle class were eaten away, uh, destroyed, and that paved the ground for Nazism. It is true that the combination of humiliation at the end of the war, of being treated that way, uh, and a serious economic crisis um, fragments the political scene and makes it possible for extremists to rise up. But, and now I'm coming to your question, if you track the electoral performance of Hitler's party in Germany and prices, you'll find that during the period of rapid inflation, the Nazis were doing extremely badly in elections. 
They were gaining no traction politically at the polling stations. Then, hyperinflation is tamed by 1927. There's a new currency, and the Weimar Republic manages to push inflation to very low levels. Then in 1929, when the crash took place beginning Wall Street, it always begins there, <laughs> and then traveled to Europe as well, Herr Brüning, the finance minister of Germany, did exactly what the Hoover administration did here. They went into austerity, massive austerity, and the result was deflation. Prices began to fall, and unemployment, of course, ballooned. If you look at the electoral results, and I've done that, uh, for instance, you know, local government elections, as well as federal elections in the Weimar Republic, suddenly you see, as prices, the rate of inflation goes below zero, in other words, you have a reduction in prices, suddenly the Nazis go from 2% to 8%, 17%, 33% in the space of 18 months. That's why I'm saying that deflation breeds monsters. In Greece, my little country, huh? we have a very proud record of having fought tooth and nail against Nazism. In the Second World War, the Wehrmacht had... Uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the, the, the national armies, but in the occupied territories of Europe, or countries of Europe, two countries gave them hell, Yugoslavia and Greece. They could not tame Greece. They managed to control the city centers, but they never managed to get a foothold on the countryside. They were constantly sabotaged, and that's why they, they committed many massacres in Greece as well as in Yugoslavia. In that, this country, as we speak, ladies and gentlemen, the third largest party in parliament, they were sitting opposite me, where my ministerial seat was, are Nazis, Greek Nazis. And they sprang up in 2012, just as prices were falling. There is no magic formula here. I'm not putting forward some kind of very sophisticated theory. All I'm saying is very simple. For capitalism to reach a stage where prices are actually falling, and falling rapidly and consistently, it must have lost its footing completely. You know, the, the working class um, is facing unemployment, and at the same time, you have small businesses who lose all custom, because when prices fall, do you know what happens? If prices fall, let's say you want to buy a fridge, a refrigerator, and you, you can see that its price is falling. Why buy today? Why not wait a few months and buy it more cheaply? But if everybody does that, then the market for refrigerators dies. Uh, so in Germany today, Germany has benefited significantly from the European crisis and from the Greek crisis on paper, in the sense of uh, a massive flight of money from the rest of Europe to the banks in Germany, because people fear in Italy, in Greece, in Spain, that our countries will get out of the European Union, or out of the Euro, uh, out of the, Euro the common currency, and that we will go back to an, in, uh, an inflated currency that will lose its value. So they take their savings and then shift them to Frankfurt. You have a German government that, has, is, that is in surplus, and so on and so forth. At the same time, because we are all part of the same Eurozone, interest rates are below zero. So what that does is that it pushes the rate of returns of pension funds, private pension funds in Germany, to negative rates. So the average middle-class person in Germany, even if they have jobs, mm -hmm, see their nest egg come down because interest rates are negative. And that has led to the rise of the alternative for Deutschland. It's a racist, very right-wing, xenophobic party that has gone from zero to 13% in one year. And now, if there were elections today, they would get 20%. So that's what I mean by deflation is breeding political monsters. I was meaning to give another short answer, or a shorter answer for a second for a change. Yeah. It's up to you. You're the boss. We have about 10 more minutes. So 10 as more minutes. As we can okay. Get through. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm a little skeptical that um, just trying to make the common citizen into a, 
economic expert is going to end up in good results. I, I, um, you know, if it's, if basically democracy is sort of an accumulation of everybody's self-interest and in the accumulation of that, hopefully you end up with a good policy, but on an economic standpoint, it's, I mean, wouldn't you always be voting for low interest rates and access to the cash register? Why would we get to the point where we would show, um, you know, an enlightened understanding of the interplay of economics that would end up with effective policy? Look, you have every reason to be skeptical. Uh, there's no way I can prove to you that you're wrong. There's no way. It cannot be proven. Um, but that is also a reason to be skeptical about democracy. Because, let's face it, it is so easy to have people that are divided and each one of us looking after their own petty little interest, or self-interest as you put it, and to fail to get together in order to create collectively the concept of the common good and the common will. It's so easy to fail at that. It's so easy to become susceptible and victims of centrifugal forces that pull us apart and allow us to go to what Margaret Thatcher's vision of society was, that there is no such thing as society. Remember when she said that in the early 1980s? And she meant it philosophically in the same way. She actually took your thinking, your skepticism, and turned it into philosophy. She liberated herself from the fear of, oh, how can the fear, the, the agony of how can we pull together and create a common will, by saying, we can't and we shouldn't, there's no such thing as society, they are just individuals and families. That's what she said in an interview she gave to the woman's own magazine. I remember it, I used to live in Britain at the time. Unforgettable. It was a very courageous thing to say, it was completely misanthropic, but at the same time extremely courageous. I like people who speak their minds. And it has an interesting philosophical, extremely negative and pathologically pessimistic, but nevertheless extremely interesting philosophical basis. And I, I miss Margaret Thatcher, you know why? Because she was a politician who actually said what she believed in. Okay, somebody may say that Donald Trump does that too, but and they would, you'll probably be right. You know, he calls Mexicans rapists and he gets away with it, and he believes it too. I don't miss that kind of thing, no. She, Margaret Thatcher was far more. No, look, let, let me go back to what, what I was saying. The reason why I will not agree with you, firstly, is because if I do, then I will not have the energy to wake up in the morning. Because if I believe what you just said, and it's very good, very good, there's a great chance you're right, then I, personally speaking, this is my own personal statement, I will lose, lose the will to live. Okay? I'm, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I won't write another book. What's the point? We're all going to die. Society's always going to be a mess. But here is the silver lining, or if you want a smidgen of hope that I want to extract from what you say. You said something about self-interest. Do you know why I'm optimistic about democracy? Because that thing is a figment of our imagination, of each one of our imaginations. There is no such thing as the self, independent of one another. You see, the liberal mind, the liberal philosophy, beginning with Thomas Hobbes, going to David Hume, John Locke, speaking philosophically for a moment, is that you know, there is a society, they are individuals, they are self-determined, they are autonomous, they know what they like and what they like what they do, and they do what they like, and all that. Yeah? Uh, they would like to do other things, but they have constraints. So the other is an ex a constraint to my liberty in this liberal Anglo-Celtic philosophy. I say Celtic because there is a bit of Scottish in there. Yeah? Um, and then so democracy is all about, as you put it, synthesizing my, what's in my self-interest with what's in, in your self-interest and find some kind of accommodation so that we can all be reasonably unhappy. <laughs> but in a way that we're not desperately unhappy. Yeah, that's, that's the, that's the Anglo-Celtic liberal tradition. But I'm a Greek. And the word politics comes from the word polis. And the ancient Greek 
Democrats believed that democracy can only grow in the polis because we have communities and the self makes no sense outside the polis. If you grow up in the jungle on your own by some machine that looks after you, you know, the Japanese have created these mag 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 magnificent robots that can look after children, the elderly. You know, you could theoretically grow up in the jungle no, without any human being next to you. You're not going to be a human being. You're going to be a savage. You're going to be a very sad non-human. So the only reason why you and I are humans and we have a self-interest is because we do it dialectically. That's another Greek word. In other words, I cannot know who I am unless I reflect myself in your eyes and you vice versa. So my self-interest cannot be defined independently of your self-interest from where I come from, from my philosophy, if you want. So in other words, it's all politics. You know, what Elon Musk understands as his self-interest did not come from the, within Elon Musk. It came from within Elon Musk as well. But it was a result of socialization, of functioning in the context of a polis. But if se the self-interest, each one of our self-interests, is defined collectively, why can't we define collectively what is in the public interest as well? So, my, that's my line and I'm sticking to it. How are you doing, uh, Dr. Varoufakis? Uh, I asked you, the, in the, I guess, uh, in the reception, uh, I said, uh, maybe not, I hope it wasn't too rude, that uh, are you still a globalist? And you said, no, you're an uh, internationalist. And I asked, what's the difference? Okay, so, that's a brilliant question, thank you. And I think that's how we will end today, yeah? Uh, globalization, it depends on how you define it. Right? But allow me to define globalization. Uh, humanity has been globalizing in an important way from the very beginning. We're all Africans, I've been told by anthropologists. We all came from Africa and spread out. So we've been globalizing before we were human or before we knew we, we were human. So globalization, you know, globalism, or the, the global dimension of the human existence, there's nothing new to this. But why, have you noticed that the word globalization was invented in 1991. It didn't exist before. There was no such thing as globalization before 1991. It was the end of the Soviet Union, the opening up of China, and the complete emancipation of Wall Street bankers from all the shackles and constraints imposed upon them by FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, in the 1930s, and later on by LBJ. Allow me to be very straightforward. So it was the emancipation of finance. So you, after 1991, what you have is a situation where money can, because of the internet as well, and the total deregulation, that's the word they use, not emancipation, deregulation of finance. Suddenly, bankers could press a button and trillions would just go everywhere around the world. So it was the internationalization, if you want to finance, while people remained behind walls and borders, unless they were rich or tourists. So you have, NAFTA is a very good example. Yeah? You have, you just go, you, I'm sure you've been to the US-Mexican border, you can see these amazing walls, the wall exists, Trump doesn't need to build it, it's there, it's been there for years. He's just going to uh, line the pockets of his uh, cement producing friends by adding a lot more cement on it. But if you go to Tijuana or to, you know, uh, El Paso and Juarez, it's, it's a huge wall there. I mean, what, what else are they going to build? The Berlin Wall looks like a walk in the park compared to Juarez. Yeah? And you see the trucks going in and out with commodities, freely moving about. The money you don't even see because it's, you know, electrons going through the internet, billions flowing. It's only the people that are behind the barriers. That's globalization for me. And I'm not a globalist. I'm an internationalist. I look at borders like a scar on the face of the Earth. Imagine being an extraterrestrial and approaching the planet in your own spaceship, whatever. And you look at this little planet, this blue thing, and you realize that these idiots there, the humans, they've created all these countless borders and they, they, they say that it's a natural right to stop people from crossing them. 
We are a species that has populated the whole earth. Look at us Europeans. Look at the inanity and the idiocy of Europeans. We, for a thousand years, have been colonizing the world. Here. Huh? It was Norwegians that came here, whatever, I don't know. Um, uh, Greeks everywhere. Yeah, we're like a plague. Um, the, the Brits, what can I say about the Brits? The French, the Spaniards, they destroyed South America and Central America, you know, decimated whole civilizations. You know, we destroyed the Aborigines in Australia, in New Zealand, the Maoris. We've colonized the world. And now we're complaining about emigration. I mean, how stupid is this? All that is happening is that now Europe has a demographic problem because we are all old farts. Yes? And the dynamics have reversed. People are coming back to Europe. I was like, no, 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 we have to build walls. We have to make sure they die in the sea, in the Aegean Sea. Because if we don't make sure they die in the Aegean Sea and to look after them on Lesbos hmm, and treat them well, uh, then more of them will come. Oh, my God, emigration, this is an abomination. We have been doing it for a thousand years. So I'm an internationalist and not a globalist. Thank you.